Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's great to see you guys for a few minutes there. I thought we, were, we would be speaking to ourselves, so I'm glad we have an audience. Welcome to this symposium, Beyond Rum and Coca-Cola, the radical and creative origins of the steel pan. I am thrilled, I'm more than thrilled to have Pan Fantasy Steel Band here at Brown. Canada's, Pan Fantasy is Canada's number one steel band. They've won the annual steel band competition in Canada for the last seven successive years. So there is no disputing where they sit <laughs> in that league table. Okay. The band drove from Toronto all of yesterday got up bright and early this morning to have a workshop with Brown students, faculty, and staff, traveled to Central Falls in the afternoon to have a workshop and to play for high school students in Central Falls. Two of the members of the band are here on the panel. And tomorrow, we are going to all relax while they all do all the hard work because they'll be performing tomorrow at 7 o'clock. So I want to welcome Pan Fantasy Steel Band to Brown. <laughs> My name is Patsy Lewis. I am the director of the Development Studies Program at Watson. And I want to acknowledge my collaborators in this effort. Africana Studies, uh, Rights and Reason Department, and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But this event, or this series of events, would not have happened without the general support of the Brown Arts Initiative's Public Presentation Grant, which is the largest source, single source of funding for this event. We also received crucial financial support from Art at Watson, the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, Africana Studies Department, CLAC, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Department of Physics via a generous contribution from Stefan Alexander, who's on the panel, and the Music Department. The people that I want to give special thanks to are Karen Baxter from Africana Studies, Rich Snyder from CLAC on Political Science, Anita Nesta from Development Study, Kelsey Powell and the Watson staff, or student assistants and Africana staff. I just want to say a little, just a little about why um, the idea behind having this symposium. Steel Pan is one of the major musical inventions of the 20th century. Trinidadians claim it's the only musical intervention. I'm not a musicologist, so I'm not going to make that claim, because somebody might say no. <laughs> Its association with leisure and revelry obscures a tremendous creativity, struggle, and marginalization that is at the heart of the creation of this magical instrument. It represents the, the marginalized peoples from a colonial backwater of the world and what they have contributed despite their existence on the margins. I think that it also represents a different narrative of development where we think of resources as, as flowing from um, plenty to lack, whether it's within countries or among countries. Instead, what we have here, something that we never think about as development or as progress, is this rich musical, cultural expression coming from people who are unemployed, marginalized, under colonial rule, and, but who manage to overcome all of this and tap into the greatest, you know, their creativity, creativity the greatest aspects of ourselves that as human beings we have. And that's where this magical music comes from. I want to acknowledge, before we go into introducing the panelists, the passing of giants, some giants in the world of steel pan and calypso over the last few months. I want to acknowledge Ellie Manet, who is considered to be the father of the modern steel drum. 
and who died August, this August at 90 years old. He was described as a master tuner, builder of the pan and steel band. He was among the first to fashion a steel drum that had all the notes of the chromatic scale so he could play any melody in any key. He taught at West Virginia University for many years. I also want to recognize Ken Fillmore, affectionately called Professor, steel band arranger, composer, and ace panis, who died on September 30th. He was in his 50s. He died from an, ac in an accident, tra tragically. I also want to recognize the mighty sparrow, Winston McGarland Bailey, who died. Oh, sorry, Shadow, sorry. No, Sparrow is not dead. <laughs> and there is a song. Sparrow is not a song. Sparrow is not dead because Sparrow has been dying for a very long time. He gets sick. He's sick. You know, the news stories come out, Shadow is dead. And then he revives. And then he sings a song. Shadow is not, um, Sparrow is not dead. But Shadow, unfortunately, is dead. And Shadow died this month at... Um, 77 years old, one of Trinidad's leading Calypsonians. I also want to express um, my support and my dismay and solidarity with the people of Trinidad. Trinidad is the home of the steel pan, the home of Calypso. Um, they have been ex experiencing widespread, unprecedented floods, um, which has brought tremendous devastation um, to people in the country. Just want to acknowledge that. Okay, to go on to our panel, I'll give you brief introductions because you have the program with more information. I'd like to introduce Sophia Edwards, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Providence College. And her title is Petrol Pan and the Creative Resistance, po resist Resistive Power of a People. Sorry. And we will follow they will follow one another as they appear on the on the podium. So Brian will speak after. Brian Meeks is chair of the Africana Studies, Rights and Reason Department, and his talk is on reflections on the origins of the steel pan. CLR James's notes on the plantation and the role of the Caribbean in the making of modernity. He'll be followed by Ivor Picou, player and arranger with Pan Fantasy Steel Band and member of the Pan and Arts Network who is also working on a documentary on Ellie Manette. His topic is Pan on the Move, Steel Pan Across Borders. And he'll be followed by Wendy Jones, the woman on the base. Wendy is co-founder and leader of the band, Pan Fantasy. And she will be speaking, her title is Stigmatizing Women in Pan. Wendy will be followed by Stefan Alexander, Deep, who is a um, theoretical physicist and jazz musician with the Department of Physics here at Brown, and his title is Pan Physics. So I'd like you to welcome our panelists. <laughs> we are asking you, we're already late, sorry, I've added to that, to try to not go over 12 minutes. Um, you know, we'll try to squeeze in a little more if you really, really, really need to. But Vanina Marson is going to be a strict timekeeper. So she's right there, and she'll, she'll hold up. So we start with Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Patsy, for that warm welcome and introduction. And thank you to all the organizers, the fellow panelists, to Pan Fantasy for coming all the way down. Um, it's just really great to be here today. Um, my, uh, what I want to talk about today is I really want to show the connections between the development of the petroleum sector and the resistance movements in Trinidad and Tobago by the working classes and the poor, and the birth of the steel pan. Um, I want to talk about how the economic and political conditions that f people faced um, were quite dire during the time period um, that the steel pan was born. But more importantly, I want to highlight that out of the, some of the same communities during the same time period came different forms of resistance. On the one hand, we had labor riots happening alongside musical in innovation 
in the same communities. And both had tremendous impacts um, on the social and economic life in Trinidad and Tobago. So just to start off, and I will move through this quickly because we have a timekeeper. Uh, uh, I just wanted to give you sort of a quick overview of the development of the petroleum industry in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm going to focus on the pre-independence period, though. But uh, the colonial Trinidad and Tobago economy really comprised of three main sectors, uh, the sugar sector, the oil sector, and the urban economy. Um, African slaves were brought to work on sugar plantations, when, uh, after slavery ended, they uh, moved into cities and got jobs in cities and looked for work in cities. And East Indian laborers replaced those African workers on the plantations. Black workers also were concentrated in the oil sector. And so uh, in this quick overview, uh, the oil sector in Trinidad and Tobago developed very quickly. Um, from the time commercial oil production began in 1908, uh, two years later, Winston Churchill announced that the British Admiralty would be converting from coal to fuel oil, and that created a boom in the Trinidad and Tobago oil sector. Um, as many companies flooded into Trinidad to extract oil for the British Admiralty. Um, by the 1930s, the oil sector accounted for 52% of the country's exports and about 20% of, uh, um, government revenues. Another major, um, change that happened in the Trinidad economy was in 1941 when the US and the UK formed an agreement to um, lease land in Trinidad to the US to have a military base. Um, during the war period, Britain wanted warships as naval reinforcements, and uh, the US wanted to extend its influence in the region. And so uh, the British, in exchange for warships, gave the US some land to build a military base. And this, the construction around the base, the money that was flowing through Trinidad, that came through Trinidad through this um, agreement, really spurred a lot of economic activity in the cities, particularly Port of Spain. Um, and so by the time Trinidad achieved independence in 1962, there were three major oil companies operating in Trinidad, Shell, Texaco, and BP, as we know them today. Um, what I want to show, though, is that this isn't a story about capitalist development based on natural resource exploitation. It, <laughs> <laughs> the dark side of this is, at the same time um, that company profits were soaring and there was a, there was a small, affluent, white class in the colony that enjoyed this economic upturn, labor faced severe hardships. And there are periods during 1919 and in the 1930s when there was tremendous labor unrest across Trinidad and Tobago, where workers in the oil sector, sugar, and urban economies um, organized colony-wide, multiracial, multi-sectoral insurrectionary movements against capitalist exploitation, colonialism, and racism. And interestingly, during 19, 1930s, when the, these labor riots peaked, was also the same time period when the steel pan emerged. Most people date the invention of the steel pan somewhere between 1934 and the early 1940s. And yes, Patsy, we claim that it was the only new non-electronic acoustic musical instrument invented in the 20th century. Um, and this also came out of the colonial oppression that people faced in Trinidad and Tobago. African drumming, which is, was central to black expression, was banned in 1883 with a music bill that prohibited the playing of drums um, uh, unless you had a permit. Uh, this colonial cultural suppression 
pushed people to find alternatives to African drumming. And there was then the invention of the tambu bamboo, which is a, another type of instrument that people used. Um, and then in 1934, the, the tambu bamboo was banned by the colonial authorities um, on the argument that there was fighting between rival bands. And that ban in 1934 prompted people to look for alternatives, and they turned to metals. And they started um, gathering tin cans and automobile parts and garbage cans and biscuit tins and so on, which ultimately led to the invention of the steel pan. And I just want to show you that it's, it's in the same in time period, but also, also out of the same communities that this innovation is happening and that this resistance is happening. This is a map from a newspaper in 1937 showing cis strikes in June in Trinidad. Um, and I just want to point out in Port of Spain, where, which was a hub of the labor riots in Trinidad in the 1930s, was also where the earliest steel pans uh, steel bands emerged. Some of the very same communities that were striking were these very same communities that were inventing the steel pan. Lavantil, John John, Gonzales, Belmont, Woodbrook, St. James. These were all places where people were innovating with the steel pan. Um, the working classes in these communities faced low wages during this time period, rising food prices, poor health and education and sanitation services, poor housing conditions, high unemployment, and there were very labor repressive legislations and no institutional bargaining mechanisms for workers and employers. Um, and all their petitions and memorials and meetings fell on deaf ears, which prompted people to adopt more militant methods of seeking reform. In Pan, in the area of Pan, this literally uh, uh, manifested itself in turning trash into treasure. Uh, what young men were doing in this time period were looking for new instruments, looking for new materials to create music they would go into the American base where there were lots of discarded oil barrels from Americans transporting oil as part of the war effort and stealing those oil drums to create the steel pan, to ultimately create the steel pan. At the same time, there was a tremendous labor activity happening in their communities. The juvenile sec there were juvenile sections of labor organizations being formed, a women's rallies happening, um, petitions, striking, meetings, all of this happening as part of the creative tactics of the working class people in those communities. These, the resistance movements were militant. Uh, there was a ban in Trinidad during the, in, during the uh, World War II suspension um, of Carnival from 1942 to 1946, and steel pan players were frequently arrested because they believed that playing steel band music was the music of the people, and they had to play it in the streets for the people. And so they would walk with pans around their necks, marching down the street, playing steel pan, even though this was against the law. So we're regularly arrested for violating these crimes, violating these laws. At the same time, workers were organizing hunger marches, strikes, uh, and other forms of resistance against their employers. I'll just read one uh, excerpt from the newspaper. Men, young and old, women and children, brandishing sticks, cutlasses, and other weapons, walked from factory to factory in the districts, inflicting workers with 
the strike fever. These districts included Belmont, Woodbrook, and St. James. These movements were anti-colonial, anti-racist, lower class mobilization. Um, the PAN was created uh, out of a resistance against racist laws that targeted black cultural expression and African culture and racist colonial policing. They fought against the oppression by the white colonial elites. Similarly, workers were making the same demands of the colonial state to reform these racist um, exploitative labor practices. According to one labor organizer, Elma Francois, the, one of the main goals of her organization was to struggle for the development and better welfare of the Negro people. In one of her speeches entitled, World Imperialism and Colonial Toilers, she says, quote, the Negro and East Indian workers who sleep under the town hall and in the square through poverty, I want to better their conditions. So just to sum up, because I'm out of time, uh, these communities were vibrant places of resistance, and these resistance, this, these res this resistance movements took different forms. On one hand, labor protests and mu musical in innovation. They really impacted the social and economic life of Trinidad and Tobago, forced the colonial state to invest more in improving the living standards of the lower classes, create institutions of industrial relations between resource extracting companies and workers, and advance decolonization and democratization. Steel pan specifically was a whole new form of cultural expression and a whole new instrument that was birthed in the world, and this came out of the creative resistance of Trinidadian people. So thank you. Thank you, Zofia, and I think you've uh, dealt with much of what I wanted to do with. So I, I suspect that my paper, my abstract may be longer than the actual paper I'm going to present, which sets a record. Anyway, let me start with two quotes. Quote, Trinidad may seem complex, but to anyone who knows it, it is a simple colonial Philistine society, unquote. Quote, history is built around achievement and creation and nothing was created in the West Indies, unquote. Both are from Vidya S. Naipaul, uh, the acclaimed uh, Trinidadian uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, and noted for his um, caustic comments on the country of his birth. The first was written in, both were in the from the 1950s, uh, the first in the Times Literary Supplement, and the second in his book, The Middle Passage. I use Naipaul's infamously caustic quotes to reflect for a brief moment on the steel band. But first of all, let me give you a caveat here in that I think I'm the only one on this panel who can't claim to be Trinidadian, or as my daughter would say, I'm probably a fake Trinidadian in that <laughs> my, my mother is Trinidadian, but I am by, by raising and inclination very Jamaican. So I, I'm. I'm I, I am the, the odd one on this, on this panel. Um, <laughs> um, I grew up, however, because of my mother's origins with, with Calypso and steel band music around me, but as heard through the gramophone um, and not in real life. The first time in the 1970s when I went to Trinidad and went to Panorama, at a time before Panorama had become as commercialized as it later became, um, and heard a full-sized steel band um, in its territory and uh, in real life, it was amazing to me as to what this thing was, because it struck me that um, at this time, this was in the era of black power, 
This was um, when um, a pan side like invaders or renegades, all stars or desperados um, from Laventil could have between 100 and 150 uh, pan players in the band. Um, there was a, a special uh, quality to, to what one heard. It was like, um, I, I, it's like, a, you know, those who, from my own country who grew up with dance hall, it was like a moving dance hall. Um, the, the volume of the sound when you were in the pan um, was, was at that level. But also, the pan represented a community effort. So when a, when a, when a band came off Laventil, off the hill into the city, um, it was like a community, an army almost. And indeed, one of the very famous early pan sides was Red Army. And I want to come back to the, the, the names of the, of the bands as they emerged in the 1940s. It was like an army was invading uh, the city of, of Port of Spain. And this army would, would enter with, with 100 players or 150 players, um, you know, with all the range of instruments from the, the tenors through the, so, the sopranos, the cellos, the guitar pans, and the bass, uh, uh, you know, carrying the, 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 the pans. And they would enter with that the, the rhythm section, which was in itself a huge part of the, the band. Um, and a whole army of support staff pushing the pans, ensuring that the, the, the carts on which they were carried uh, followed the road, uh, went in the right direction, and um, obviously maintained the pan players in terms of, of drink and food and what have you. Um, uh, literally an army on the march. And at the end of Carnival on, on, on last lap, the band would retreat back up the hill would retreat back, just as an army after battle would retreat back to its original quarters, as, as, uh, of, of course, having won the battle, um, one presumes, or even having lost the battle, would retreat to its origins until next carnival when it would emerge again in all its splendor. I, 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 I mention this because there is something about Pan which you cannot understand unless you see it in its country of origin or in the countries close to Trinidad and Tobago where it has become uh, very much a part of the culture. In, on its, in its full, what you see is, uh, and what you will see tomorrow night is, is a section of a band. Uh, or what most people in North America see is a small pan side with 10 players or you know, at best, or maybe just a single player playing the pan. But you cannot understand pan unless you see it in its full dress as the army coming out from the hill into the city, into the plain to do battle. Uh, uh, to help me think about this phenomenon then, I return to CLR James's, who is uh, another famous son of Trinidad and Tobago, and his seminal text of Caribbean history, The Black Jacobins, where he argues that plantation slavery, rather than to be seen as purely a feature of capital in its phase of primitive accumulation, which of course it was uh, with certainty, was at the forefront of capitalist development in many respects, in terms of the scale, technology, and organization of the enterprise. This applied in some respects also to the social organization of labor, which while decisively not free, which therefore did not make it uh, uh, capitalist in the, in the Marxian sense, was organized in ways that facilitated communication, cooperation, and solidarity, all of the sociological requirements without freedom for a militant proletariat. James's conclusions, of course, uh, when he applied this analysis to, uh, to Saint-Domingue, uh, the, the country which later became Haiti, was that the revolt of the slaves and their ultimate success 
uh, in the creation of the free nation of Haiti was not to be relegated to some fluke of political nature. How did that happen? It happened because these were organized forces on the ground, um, which were organized in part by the nature of um, um, plantation slavery. And, and that um, in this, he located um, Saint-Domingue and her, her inhabitants um, as, on the one hand, part of an unrelenting barbarity, which is what slavery is, but simultaneously at the forefront of an alternative vision of modernity in their struggle to invent a new world of truly universal freedom. So I'm reflecting on James's argument to think about the development of the steel, steel pan in wartime Trinidad, uh, that is the Second World War Trinidad, and to suggest its symbolic importance as not simply an eccentric novelty from an obscure island of mimic men, to use another of V.S. Naipaul's phrases, but a remarkable artifact of late modernity which crosses the boundaries between music, culture, and politics to become both a broad avenue for community organization and popular self-assertion, as well as a central instrument of anti-colonial mobilization. Pan, in other words, and in summary, is more than it seems to be. Far from a blank space then, as implied in Naipaul's caustic reflections on the land and also the region of his origin, I'm suggesting that the steel ban is in its creation and practice a novel instrument of the 20th century. Uh, I, you notice I say novel, and that's the only, I leave that to Zofia. <laughs> a school for popular music education, a venue for community building, and by implication for nation building, a site and venue more recently for gender equality and feminist assertion all of which lead us to consider it as a peculiar, complex product of late modernity, as well as, as well as a potential site for alternative conversations as to what the world of the future might look like. So with that, I simply present an agenda for further exploration. And I'm just going to present maybe three or four, maybe five points that I think an agenda might have. Um, first, uh, we need to explore improvisation as a lens through which to think about Afro-Caribbean survival. And I use improvisation here uh, in its many dimensions. Comparative improvisation, thinking about jazz, DJ, reggae, dancehall, calypso, uh, which, is, which is also another Trinidadian form which crosses over with steel band, but is independent in its own right of steel band. Uh, and I, I want to think of, of steel band in this sense, not as only playing improvised music, but as an improvisation in its own right, in the way in which Zofia described its emergence from um, the unavailability of other materials and how it becomes. So improvisation is one lens that I want to focus on. The second is the peculiar history of Trinidad. Uh, which, which needs to be understood as a very peculiar place in the Caribbean. It's the last colony in the Anglo-Caribbean, Trinidad and Guyana to some extent, but, but Trinidad is, is the last colony. If you think about a place like Barbados or Jamaica, these are 17th and 18th century colonies. You, you go to Barbados and you see Georgian structures. Uh, Trinidad is a 19th century colony, and uh, downtown Port of Spain and Woodbrook, uh, if you want to find it, its, its colonial architectural uh, equivalents, you need to go to Cape Town or somewhere like that. And you see buildings that you say, oh, oh so this is where Trinidad was in the scheme of British colonialism. So there's a peculiar history of Trinidad's late entry into the colonial space, which needs to be considered. Uh, which also means that it, 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 it has many peculiarities. For example, Africans who arrive after slavery as indentures and therefore bring uh, a less modified version of West African culture than what 
uh, happens on this on the slave plantation. So we ha you have living Yor Yoruba cul culture, for example, in Trinidad, which is recognizably Yoruba because it wasn't affected by um, the the brainwashing of of the plantation system. The Indian presence, I think, is very very important here because both the Yoruba tradition and the Indians brought talking drums um, of their own kind. Uh, the, 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 the Yoruba talking drums and the Indian tabla, um, which therefore uh, perhaps influenced uh, urban Trinidadians to think about drums as being able to talk, uh, and which, which is something that we need to think about. Um, the third thing is the US presence. And I have zero time, so I'm just going to say the, the, the US presence we need to think about and we need to think also about the peculiarity of World War II and how it is that the defeat of the Germans and the Japanese in World War II and the celebrations around that defeat was a key moment in uh, the birth of, of, of the steel band and what that means. So that's really an agenda to think about. Thank you. Yes, yeah, pretty good. Hi, everybody again. And a couple things before I begin, and one is I want to um, acknowledge my fellow documentarian who is here today, Anthony Peer. It's with him and another um, videographer, and we are putting together the Ellie Manet documentary, document, documenting the life of one of the foremost innovators of the steel band. So I don't know if you left clapping, but give a heel. All right. And... Um, I probably have three main points that I'd like you to take away, and I'll explain that later, right, so that you can go and say, yes, these three things were uh, really insignificant in the presence of the steel band in Toronto, okay? And in the interest of time, I'm going to be doing some what they call compression. You guys know in computer, they got compression, right? So I'm going to read mainly from my notes, and I'm going to drop every fourth word. So <laughs> hang on. <laughs> All right, so in the interview, uh, sorry, in this interview of the steel band in Toronto, and therefore Canada, right, I will use the following terms to refer to the steel pan instrument and its related forms. Some say pan, steel pan, steel band, steel orchestra, and probably a couple others, right? So you may hear that, and I'm just embracing the terms used by the people who create the instrument, people who arrange music for the instrument, and people who manufacture the instrument, people who support the instrument, people who grew up with the instrument. So they use all these various terms. And still, there's sometimes some you know, disagreement about exactly how this instrument should be called. But for the time being, it's a steel pan, which best describes what it is, made of metal, and all the notes are on one surface. Uh, some people say steel drum, and then, you know, some, but, like, like somebody's doing physics here, right? They'll say, like, a drum is one that, you know, vibrates in a certain way, all right? And so there are no individual notes in it, so that the steel pan, all right, has all these individual notes, and therefore should be called a steel pan. So you're welcome to join the argument sometime in life, right? <laughs> all right? So, like, again, I'm referring to the instrument or the family of instruments developed in Trinidad and Tobago in the late 30s and 1940s, you know, onwards. And I don't have any particular loyalty to any other ideas about, you know, is it the only instrument, what are, it, it's a gift to the world. It's out there and they know where it came from. And so that is fairly well established and I want to get on with the task of, you know, making great music for this instrument, right? Now, in looking at the period, I've divided the time of Pan in Canada into roughly three time periods. Of course, you know, like these, are, these divisions are artificial. And each period, however, is characterized by what was going on with the pan at the time, what were the main activities, who was doing what at the time, right? And that's, you know, my kind of thrust, all right, direction. To get a reasonably clear picture of the arrival of pan in, in, in Toronto and therefore Canada, we should look at whether there were, what were the other historical events of the time. That time was in the mid-1950s when the pan actually arrived in um, Toronto or Canada. Now, Canada is a big country, all right? And sometimes, you know, I'm not sure what's in the minds of people who reside in the United States. 
because I have a sister who lives in New York City, right? And she came to Toronto to, to visit me a few years ago, and she was shocked I lived in a house. All right, so I'm never... <laughs> I'm not sure what, where she thought I was living all this time, right? But she came up and she said, there's some great houses here. All right? But it's big. So Toronto is, I forget what it is, I'm like 34 square miles maybe, all right? But Toronto, I mean, Canada is a couple million square miles. We use kilometers up there, right? So a few million, million square kilometers, right? It's the second largest country in the world after Russia, all right? So Toronto, like we know, is like out of the millions of square kilometers we have Toronto, right? So just to make that clear, right? So that was in the 1950s when the pan found its way or was, you know, into Toronto, right? Um, and I want to, you know, just recap some of the historical things that would happen, other, you know, things. And because in the 1950s, it was still a decade after the Second World War, all right? And that was the significance of that is that, you know, it was, we were part of the British Commonwealth, all right? And the British Commonwealth kind of grew out of the, not grew out, it was established earlier, right? But it, I can, it gained further prominence after the Second World War because, you know, the, the British had lost, had severe losses during the Second World War. And, you know, they were trying to rebuild their infrastructure, their industrial capacity and everything. And so they were just, you know, sourcing, I want to say manpower, mainly men, but I guess people power, a lot of women, all right? And uh, there was a lot of emigration or migrations between colonies and also to England, all right? And uh, because Canada was and still is part of the Commonwealth, all right, there was also migration from the Caribbean, especially up into um, Canada, right? And somebody talked about the oil gems, and I'm glad they did that, all right? So um, I could skip that, all right? But the oil gem is significant in the sense that it was one of the two spurs to the development of what the modern pan looks like, all right? Migration, all right? The 45-gallon drum, again, you know, the British had made a deal, too, with the uh, United States, all right? Um, we give you a piece of land, they gave away a piece of Trinidad, all right, uh, for the use of a base, and so the, the uh, United States sent tremendous amount of supplies to England to help with the war, all right? So that's the kind of background, all right? And as a result, you know, the 45-gallon drum was kind of adopted or, you know, used or embraced as one of the final you know, forms for the, the, the pan instrument. As you know, you probably have seen it somewhere, right? Some of you saw it this morning, but you'll probably see it tomorrow. You're coming tomorrow, right? Yes, you are. All right? <laughs> and you'll see the 45-gallon drum, and that's what the pan looks like. I mean, there are some more modern developments on it, but basically that's what the standard is right now, all right? But in 1954 was one of the first times that a pan group left Trinidad and came to Toronto, Canada. And they came there, all right, to be part of the Canadian National Exhibition, which is like a trade and, you know, agricultural fair. It's kind of it's still around. It has, it changes form, but it's still like agricultural and things. They still have, uh, they bring farm animals and they talk about, you know, what's going on in agriculture. And, uh, but it's more like uh, a fair now, a carnival, where they have rides and every kind of thing. Okay, I got to look at this person here, right? So anyway, in 1954, they came performed, wowed everybody, and left. So there was no permanent presence. The next year, however, one person came there, a guy called Selwyn Gomes, right? And he came there thinking he'd be going to school and, you know, trying, as they say, better their life, whatever that meant back then, or I guess in a material sense, okay? Uh, but he was a player in Trinidad, and he came there, all right, thinking, you know, I'll, do, I'll go to school, I'll get my degree, maybe I'll stay, maybe I won't stay, all right? But he, it, he didn't come with the idea that I would stay in Toronto and become a panist, all right, and be one of the early forerunners of people who played the instrument and may, in fact, like, you know, uh, make the instrument, popularize the instrument in Toronto. But he did come, all right? He's still alive, by the way, not in the best shape, but he's still alive in Toronto, all right? And so he came there in 1955, right? And pretty soon, you know, he discovered that, you know, he got a pan, loved music, played the pan, and that people were really interested in the music, all right? So then he continued, and he brought together a band made with the pan and other instruments and played in many different small venues and found that the instrument was really popular and the music was really popular, right? And this is the period where um, developing from the 50, 50, 1955 onwards, you find um, 
Many players in small bands play in different small club venues, parties, events, promotions, and you know, then it, it took a kind of a more serious turn because the people realized that, you know, they also, more people were coming from the Caribbean. More people were coming from, you know, across the Caribbean, Trinidad too as well in particular, right? And there was this yearning of a sense of like, you know, well, who are we in this transplanted surroundings, all right? Are we, uh, are we just, uh, you know, immigrants, what does that, whatever that means, all right? But are, are we people coming here now to participate in this society and do we just, erase who we are or do we kind of make sure that we try to, you know, maintain that sense of identity and the pan was, that's how the pan began to function uh, with the kind of musics that people were playing, all right? And this was going on during the 50s and to the 60s where, you know, more players came, more people came, but it was still kind of a small bands playing around, all right? And then we, we moved into the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, where actually something really significant happened in 1967, all right? It was the centenary of Canada. Canada had been established 100 years before, and so they were celebrating 100 years of being Canada, all right? And the Caribbean community, which had grown to a point for thousands of people at that point decided um, that they would, as a gift, all right, or as a way of participating in Canada's centenary, they would produce a, a carnival for the city or for Canada. And so they produced mask, masquerade bands, all right, they produced, you know, music bands, and they also, you know, brought a steel band. So that, you know, gave a sense of self-assurance, a sense of who we are, in this new surrounding, all right, and also they're able to showcase who they are to the rest of uh, the Canadian society, right? So that was a pretty significant time, and that spurred on, you know, more bands to begin, you know, appearing, people to make more bands, make more music using the steel pan, okay? So that's the second significant thing. And then beyond that, you know, we get later on into the 70s, the early 70s, right? I think, Tony, you came there in 1969? 19, 67. 67. Oh, he might have been at Expo, too. <laughs> I want to make a joke, you know, because, I mean, I got to tell you, well, you guys are learning about history, right? As we said, you know, exposition. You know, there was a really horrific, um, uh, what do you call it, exhibition of a woman back, or people back then in the, I guess the World Fair in 1896 or something like that, where they had an African woman on display. So, I mean, sometimes I make these lighthearted comments, but then it has these serious sometimes, you know, echoes that imagine they put a human being on display in a cage and says like, wow, she, you know, she's a specimen. Anyway, so that's the time that we passed 67, all right, and that was the expo and, you know, people of Caribbean, you know, um, what it is, origin are uh, in Toronto, contributing, making Toronto great. Great. All right. Okay, and so they were there and on and on and on, all right. And more things began to happen. I think more people came. And, more, and you know, I got, we got to say this. I got to repeat this because often people sometimes, you know, I mean, you guys have this discussion here. What is the value of the immigrants, all right? And in Toronto, it's of great value because you have a lot of people who have come there, right, and um, contributed in immense ways, you know. With, and I, when I talk about immigrants, I'm talking about the whole wide gamut of immigrants, right? And even those who are sometimes stigmatized or, you know, called like, you know, you're just immigrants, loafers, you know, um, sponges, whatever. They've made tremendous contributions to the society, and, and Canada is recognized as one of the leaders in the world. Yeah, okay, and uh, so we're moving on from the 1967 Expo where people got down. We get into the 70s where there are more bands. By the way, during these first early periods, right, there were no people in Toronto who made the pans, so they were playing them, all right, but they would send to Trinidad mainly for the pans. So you want to play a pan, you would send to Trinidad for them to send you a pan. They would also, bam, all right? They'd also be ingenious enough, so tomorrow you're going to see one of those big pans. They would cut the top off, all right, from the bottom, ship the top, which was just like a, a big circle, right? And then they would, you know, weld back on the sides of it. This is, and then in the 70s, we find that tuners began to come and live in Toronto, established, so we had tuners, bands grew bigger, 
All right. So and then bands actually started to have their own events. They'll have block parties, the street parties. All right. To the point where it was so big. All right. That the Toronto Transit Commission, they run all the public transportation. They used to tell the state bands, could you call us and tell us when you're having a, a big street party so we could put more streetcars on, more buses on, and we could reroute things. And it's like, you've made it, so to speak, all right? And moving on from that, where, you know, um, uh, the big bands being established, they have competitions, all right? It's in the schools right now. We have over 60 steel bands across schools in Toronto and growing. And I just want to add one last thing, which was kind of unfortunate, because it's always the time they brought the bands into the school, it always has this kind of anthropological and sociological role. It's like we're trying to do this to help the Caribbean students. You know, the instrument is a great musical instrument in its own right, all right? And there is that aspect of it, and which is one aspect that I often remind people of, right? It's a great teaching instrument. It's a lovely instrument for music, all right? And so I often have to remind people, we don't always have to make it seem like, oh, we got to make it to save the bunch of the people, the Caribbean, or whatever. Uh, I, don't, I'm, I have short, little tolerance for that, right? Even though sometimes I'll work the point if I think it's been forgotten. Thank you very much, and thank you. <laughs> Good night, good evening. I just did the trainee thing. Um, my name is Wendy Jones, and I just wanna say thank you so much for having us here. I'm so excited about this. Um, where can I start? Uh, when I think of Pan, I think of music. And everybody is gonna be there tomorrow to hear music, right? Um, I wanna thank all the panel participants um, about the history of PAN and, and I'm glad we didn't have to go back and research all these things here because I don't think I would have slept last night. But what I want to talk about is women in PAN. When we look around, we think of the whole ramification of women in the home, women working, and then we have women in PAN. So I'm gonna start from the top for me. Um, Ivor just mentioned one thing at the end there, and it started out like this. I came from Trinidad. I am a Trinidadian. I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. I left Trinidad when I was nine years old and went to Canada, because my mother, of course, thought that this was an opportunity for her children to have a better education. And like most immigrants, as Ivor has said, we all left home. Home was Trinidad. We didn't want to leave, but we left. So coming to Canada, the coldest place ever in November, I remember the one thing I said was this, why are there no leaves on the trees? And I recall that, but I didn't understand why, because I was going into something called the seasons. And the seasons was a good thing, but I didn't know anything about it. When I got to grade nine, uh, let me just back up. I came from a family of seven. So my brothers, who were older than me, played Pan in Trinidad. And growing up in Trinidad, Pan was Pan. Only the boys got to the, go to the Pan yard. I recall my mother taking us to Carnival. And within 10 minutes in Carnival, we left because there was some fight going on and a bottle went flying and this went flying and she just picked us all up and we left. The reason I'm talking about that is because I didn't understand that season until later on. I sat with my uncle, who was a member of the Red Army Steel Band, and Casablanca, and Invaders, and Solo Hamanites, and these were the bands that my family grew up in. But we weren't allowed to go to the Panyard, my mother's three girls. So coming to Canada, we left all that behind. I was not involved in PAN at all. I went to school, I came home, I went to church. Um, today I mentioned in the workshop that we were doing that I took up violin playing, which I didn't like. I then moved from a violin to a cello, which was too heavy to carry. And I thought to myself, I don't want to carry this thing around. And um, the opportunity came one day while I was at school in grade nine, 
One of the members of the band, who I will introduce to more, his name was Saint Tell, and a couple others that I grew up with in the community said to me, you know, you should come and listen to us. And I said, listen to you do what? And he said, play pan. And I said, play pan. And I'm thinking, this is, this is strange now, because you see, when you, you leave Trinidad, you left a lot of things at home, because now you are Canadian. Being Canadian meant that you adopted to your surroundings, you adopted to your school, you wanted to change your language because you need to sound Canadian now. And um, we did all of those things. And as I walked into the portable that afternoon, I heard the sound of music. And I thought, wow, this is excellent. I want to do this. I gravitated to the largest instrument in the room, which was the bass. And as we say, rest in peace to shadow. Bim bom bi dim bom. Bom bim bom bi dim bom. Bom bim bom bi dim bom. Bom 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 And you know, the sound of the bass man was in my head. And it stayed in my head for the last 32 years. And I say that because it was something that I started to fall in love with. And you know, you're supposed to fall in love with boys at that age. I fell in love with Pan. Um, I, I really did. And I haven't stopped being in love with Pan. I think I love Pan more than my husband. But anyway, um, that's one of those things, you know. But he's in the band too, so it's okay. Um, so at that point, I went home and I said to my mother, Mom, you know what? I want to play Pan. And she said to me, No. And I was like, What? No, pan. I said, Mom, but I like pan. I like how it sounds. It's beautiful. So I, I, didn't, I didn't get into that conversation with my mother anymore because we now were offering in the school system a music program. And it was a credited program, which I found out, under the uh, tutelage of Mr. Earl Appear Sr., who was now, as I found out, one of the top uh, steel pan arrangers in Toronto, and he also came out of that journey after Cello Gomes teaching in the school system. And Earl was the teacher and facilitating that program in the afternoons, and I gravitated towards that really quickly. And I thought, no, I think this should be a credited program. So I went home and I said to my mom, I'm going to get a credit for this. And she said, okay, that was fine. But my mom really didn't know the extent of what was happening. You see, I was liming in the pan yard every evening now because liming was one of the things that we did at school. But I didn't know all the things that I had left behind was now coming to be fruitful. I am going to keep going. I then gra gravitated towards a band called Afropan in the summer months where we would play. But then I noticed that there was some stuff going on. And we're talking about women in Pan. There were less women in the band, but there were more men in the band. And why couldn't I go to the Pan Yard? You know why I couldn't go to the Pan Yard? I had to go back to the seasons of Trinidad now and find out the history of Trinidad. You see, women weren't allowed in the Pan Yards because they were stigmatized. Is that they are a jamit or a bajan woman, and you're this, and you're drinking, and you're not supposed to be there. Oh, what does that mean? So I had to go and learn the history of Trinidad. And this is one of the things that started to happen. You weren't allowed to be in the pan yard because women were looked upon in a different light. And I thought, no, I'm going to change that for me. I want to play pan, and this is who I am. And I think that being a woman and playing pan, people have to look up to you. So I started to look at the history. And then I thought, in part of that history, I saw Pat Bishop. And I thought, wow, Pat Bishop was one of the wonderful women that stood up. And she was the first woman to stand and sing with Tripoli. And all, all the other bands that came after that. I got to meet Pat Bishop and people like Jocelyn Seeley. And women like Daisy, who was part of the history of women in Pan. And women in Pan meant, for me, that um, the opportunity came later that I would be one of those women in Pan. I then went on to say to myself that Pan Fantasy Steel Band came out of us leaving Afropan as young people. We left Afropan and formed the Pan Fantasy Steel Band, but it came under a group called the North York Intercommunity Youth Group, meaning that we were engulfing young people. We were calling the people to come now. And all the young people that came weren't just men 
or males, they were females also. And being a mentor myself, I thought this was an opportunity to sit and talk with young people. And this is part of my job now as a youth counselor. I work for the Toronto Catholic District School Board. And I saw that there was a stigma behind that because the, the young people and the young women, the, the parents were afraid to drop off their young girls. Why? Because they had that mentality of Trinidad. What did it look like? Is there drinking in your panyard? Is there smoking in your panyard? How are my young girls are gonna be seen in the panyards? And I thought, no, if you leave your child with me, they're good to go. So the bands in Toronto now have fluctuated with at least 50 to 60% of women. In Trinidad, we had, in the, in, back in the 30s, it was mostly men that were in these bands. Now, in the early 70s, there was a rise of women in all the steel bands. There's 80% women playing pan now in Trinidad. And the word we say pan or steel pan, it's the same thing. We look at it that way, or a steel orchestra. And I am so happy to know that women aren't afraid to be a part of these panyards anymore. We are not just the, the, the caregivers, but we are the caregivers in the panyard too. And, and how, why do I say that? We come with food, we come with everything, because we are counselors in the panyard. And I think that is what has changed uh, a lot of the, the, the steel band movement, where the women have come in now, and we're seeing all the young kids growing up in the panyard. I want to say rest in peace to Professor, because under the Pan Arts Network in Toronto, Ivor is also a part of that, we um, showcase Pan in Toronto. And that means that we bring up musicians from Trinidad and around the world, um, I could say like Vancouver and different places. And these people were, I just, this week I had to, I was reading something and I just realized that the Headleys that migrated from Trinidad that live in Vancouver, they go way back as part of our history. And I wanna say that um, the history that we have in Pan is huge. And when you sit down, and, and Ivor and, um, and Tony, and uh, there's one other person with you, who's that? Gregory. And uh, they're looking at history. And I thought, when you look at the history of Pan, and the, the movement of the bands in Trinidad, the arrangers, and all, all the people that make up a Pan side. In Toronto, I can say this, and I say this to my brother who spoke earlier, our arranger is Jamaican. All right, so we good for that. <laughs> And we win seven times, and he's a Jamaican arranger. <laughs> so um, unlike those who are Trinidadian arrangers, Al also grew up in the band from 16 years old. And I want to say, like, all this, the young people that grew up with Pan Fantasy Steel Band are still with Pan Fantasy Steel Band over 32 years, including myself. I am now playing. I've been with the band for 32 years, but I'm only 25. And, um, <laughs> I've been playing for 45 years. So um, as I said, the love of the instrument is what I'm all about. And um, today I want to say that the negativities and all the things that have hampered women in Pan, I have risen above that. And I will continue to rise above that because we are not just a band. We are a family. We are together and we love one another. So if somebody hurts in the band and I get a phone call, and a parent says, this is what's going on, I get up and I go. It is not just about the band. It's the family of Steel Pan. Toronto has grown. We have over 10 community bands. And every year we put on shows. And those shows bring to the forefront the level of talent of women and young people in Toronto and across Everywhere that we have traveled, including places like Manitoulin Island, we had the opportunity and we were invited to Trinidad and Tobago under the international panorama. And that was a great opportunity for the women in our band to see other women in Trinidad, the magnitude of playing. So, you know, when we say something, we tell everybody, get up and jump and wave. And you know, you get up and you love up the music. But you know, the most important thing is, Trinidad didn't leave me when I left Trinidad. It was always there. And I say to the young people, embrace your culture. Don't lose your culture. Make sure that you teach people about your culture and lift yourself up with the culture that God gave you. That is where you were born. That is where you came from. And that is who you are. Thank you.
prop so is important. Um, this is not a pan, by the way. <laughs> but it's a very advanced instrument. But it's actually to um, the. So actually, um, my uh, presentation is actually a story. <clears throat> it's a story of um, that actually begins in Jamaica. I was born in Trinidad, and I left Trinidad when I was um, eight years old, moved to the Bronx, New York. Um, and I think, Wendy, you left off on a perfect note for me, because my story really is about, um, the in a lot of ways, reconciling culture. As a person that um, left Trinidad when I was eight years old, and I grew up in New York City, uh, and, you know, and the struggle started with um, being trained as a Western scientist, as a physicist. And um, <clears throat> I would say about in the middle of grad school, I felt very dejected. Uh, I, I, you, there was a real lack and a real need for a lot of us. I did my PhD at Brown. And there was a real lack and need for especially the black students, the black PhD students, to really have mentors. Because um, it was very difficult for us to see ourselves as professors as, as actually making it. Um, <clears throat> and um, the few that were there at the time, Anani and Paget Henry, for example, um, they were not physicists, but I used to pretend that he was. I mean, you did the undergraduate in physics, okay. So, so from time to time, Paget used to take me out to lunch. And you know, at, at one point, I said, Paget, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this physics business. I'm about to quit. He said, come back tomorrow for lunch. I said, okay, free lunch again. <laughs> All right, cool. So I remember, was, right, Paragon was open. They, they were just open at that, at that time. This was probably like 25 years ago. Um, and he had an envelope. He came with an envelope. And it had a few thousand dollars in the envelope. And he said, take this. Before you quit, go, my, my cousin is a professor of physics at UWE in Jamaica. I said, are you kidding me? A free trip to Jamaica? Oh, man, I can't wait. So I, here I am at the University of West St. Zimona, hanging out in the physics department in Jamaica. And I made a friend of a, another astrophysicist. Um, I write my second book, and there's a chapter in the book called The Rasta Astrophysicist. So he was what they call a bald head Rasta. The guy, the guy had a regular haircut. He was some Dominica, um, doing his PhD in galactic astrophysics. And um, <clears throat> you know, he refused to do PhD anywhere else. He did it in Jamaica. And he, did, he said, we're going um, to go to the beach. I said, really? This is great, man. I'm gonna, wait, this is like work, work hours. You're taking me to the beach? So, he said, yeah, I'm going to the beach. So we go to the beach, and then he takes, I remember, we get to the beach. I'm like, ready, you know, start, you know, getting the water and swim. He said, no, 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 we're going to go to the wet part of the sand. And he took, uh, I think it was like, uh, it was a branch from um, a coconut tree. And he started painting equations. He said, I'm doing my work here. Now, this was, in a very, this was an epiphany for me, because it was the first time where I saw how a big part of my, you know, the dichotomy that, that I had made and the association I made of trivializing the sort of um, tourist culture um, and separating that from, from work. No, he went to the beach to work. And that was a Caribbean thing. So that's kind of um, the, the, the um, basis of that. And after I came back to Brown and finished my PhD and uh, whatever. I'm back here as a professor. But actually, um, there's a second part to the story. I made it actually a... Um, uh, I don't know what the word is, a habit of mine, maybe that's a bad word, but um, to always return back to the Caribbean. And now part two of my story begins um, uh, 18 years ago. I went back to the University of the West Indies in Trinidad to give um, a lecture in the physics department there on string theory. At that time I was working on something called super string theory. I don't work on that stuff anymore. It's, uh, it's, uh, the theory turns out to be kind of wrong. Um, <laughs> okay. And, um, and then um, I, I, I'm not going to do any kind of like, um, let, me, let me stay positive here. <laughs> but there was some rumor that some people over in the engineering department teething money from the government to do all kind of pan stuff, research. And I said, really? Who are these people? I'm not going to mention names. Um, this is not being recorded, right? Is it? Yes. All right. You, you, OK, please edit that out. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> all right, so anyway. Um, make a long story short, um, I'm over at the engineering school talking about the vibrations of strings, the geometry of the vibration of strings, and um, 
to um, <clears throat> the, the dean of the engineering school and a bunch of engineers at the University of the West Indies. And uh, is that, um, is a, yeah, all right. So upon um, hanging out at the University of West Indies, I became friends, um, this is not the, there's a um, professor at the University of the West Indies named Achong, who just recently wrote a 1,200 page book on the pan. All right, well, a lot of it is the physics of the pan. Let me just say, not only is a pan the, the sort of the, the unique instrument of this, of the last century, it's also the most com complex, one of the most complex acoustical instruments of our time. We still do not understand the physics, the acoustics of the pan. It is still a matter of research. So this was one of the first um, papers that really came out with they're basically studying the vibrational pattern of the pan. Now, I wanted to say why the pan is so unique as an instrument in terms of its physics. And I want to contrast that with another important instrument, which became, of course, the um, go-to instrument in jazz music, especially bebop jazz, and because of its, because of its um, tonal flexibility, the saxophone. So I, didn't bring, I did not bring my tenor sax. Oh, sorry about it. Thank you. Thank you, boss. <laughs> I didn't bring my tenor sax, but I want to demonstrate something. In about 500 BC, Pythagoras um, realized that, the, that basically if you take a string and you actually start you know, studying the vibration of the string in terms of integers, you generate the 12-tone scale. <laughs> You know, kids know that. Those, those frequencies are related to each other in, in, um, in integers. The, this is what we call a linear response. The steel pan is a much different piece. The steel pan is an instrument that generates what we call sympathetic vibrations. So as actually what you were saying, it's not quite a drum and it's not quite a tonal instrument. What do I mean by that? If you look at... Um, this is like looking down at the pan. You, you see that the pan basically is, um, has a, it's indented like this, and if you look down, and you see that ev every patch there corresponds to a note. Sympathetic vibration basically means the following. If I have my saxophone and I generate a note, and that note travels outward and interacts with something else, and that thing vibrates at similar frequencies that's agreeable, the sum total of that frequency generates a new frequency that gives a kind of, uh, uh, gives a richness that cannot be, um, that's very hard to actually reproduce electronically. That's why, as um, I think you said, it's very hard, unless you, s you listen to the pan as a live phenomenon, it's very hard to, um, to sort of recreate that because the way the instrument vibrates, it's a holistic vibration. When you hit one note, it interacts with all of the other notes in a sympathetic manner that makes the instrument what we call nonlinear and very difficult for an acoustician to, um, to understand. If I get to the next page, please. And so what you're looking at here, for example, is if you hit one note on the pan, you see that the other, these are, these are um, they use a, some kind of interesting holographic projection to, 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 to see the vibrations. When you hit one note, the other note starts vibrating sympathetically. That's what gives the pan this rich, unique sound that's very hard to record, actually, and generate electronically. Even the sides of the pan starts to vibrate and radiates frequencies outward. These are the vibrations, some examples of the vibrational pattern. So anyway, the point I'm just trying to make here is that the physics is very rich, and that really inspired me because I realized that what Pythagoras did that took 2,500 years for um, physicists and mathematicians to understand, the pan is um, still actually still very much a, a, an acoustic mystery. I mean, we understand some things about it. Um, so yeah, it turns out that the people that I ended up talking to, Brian Copeland being one of them, um, he's an engineer and now he's a principal of UWE. I met Brian about 18 years ago when he was just on the faculty and he told me the following thing, and this now, this, I'm just going to tie this into what does this have to do with me as a scientist, and how culture um, actually has, can turn back, you know, this pan was, you know, the pan was invented as an art form, and now that art form has turned out to be a situation that influences scientists as well. 
So it's, it's a now a reverse situation. Um, so the, the, uh, the thing that I found interesting about that was a lot of um, Caribbean scientists who are trained in the West, we often sit, sit around you know, and, and, and fantasize about how we can go back and uh, affect development and that kind of stuff. But what Brian Copeland did was actually quite interesting. I want to end with kind of what, what he really did that in, inspired, did, was kind of unique as a scientist, as an engineer. He went back to Trinidad and he started, he said, I wanted my, I wanted my he was trained as an like electrical engineer. And he went back to Trinidad and wanted, he wanted to get directly involved and develop technology that really impacted the people. So he started hanging out with some pan players. And uh, apparently what happened, I guess, during like, you know, um, the, the, the road march and like, yeah, carnival, they were competing with DJs now and the pan could not amplify properly. So he started using his electrical engineering skills to try to figure out how to, re how to understand the vibrational patterns of the pan. And that, that challenge actually started to influence actually the amplifiers and the electronics. So this was an example of how you know, um, using sort of things that are akin to the culture to inform the technology and the science. So I'm just going to end on that as a way to say that thank you, Paget, for um, you know, t you know, making sure that I went to Jamaica. Uh, thank you. Paget is setting a really high bar for the rest of us in terms of <laughs> nurturing students. Thank you very much um, to the panelists for a very rich discussion, and we'll now open um, up to the floor for questions and comments. Uh, yes, Colin Chana. Can you um, introduce yourself? Yes, hi, my name is Colin Chana. And um, a professor in the literary arts here at Brown. And the um, first thing is that I just wanted to say that, um, and as Brand, you know, knows, you know, that the fact that your arranger is Jamaican just shows the greatness of Jamaica, really. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, the serious question is, for, for people who don't know, could you explain the concept of the panyard, right, and how the panyard fits into carnival mm -hmm. and the sort of larger music and social sphere? Sure. Am I on? Yeah. So how does, how it all begins is this. The panyard is actually a term that is used in Trinidad um, that we've all adopted. Our panyards are not sometimes always a regular panyard like Trinidad. Um, some of us are lucky and some of us are greatly lucky in, in Toronto. Uh, Pan Fantasy has had a panyard for the last 15 years which is a site where the bands can come outside in the summer. And it's an open air concept. You may have a space to store your equipment, but you need an open air concept because people roam in and out of the panyard. So what happens in the summer for us, the month of July is our, our most busiest month. And that is the month that the band starts, to, ba most bands in Toronto start preparing for the Pan Alive competition and taking us into the word, quote unquote, caravana season, which is mass, calypso, and pan. Those three go together. And um, we start rehearsing and we bring our instruments outside. Um, with the makeup of most of the bands, when they bring the instruments outside, they go into racks. Racks look something along the line like a, I always use the terminology of an eggshell, and you take the egg and you put it into the little crates without those crates, you know? So the band, um, have these racks that are built and the pans go inside of them. So we store these outside. So we bring everything and we put them outside. So automatically that becomes part of the season that, that you're gearing up for. Um, on going into the carnival season, the bands will rehearse outside. That is when we all keep saying we're going to the panyad, the panyad, the panyad. The panyad itself is an atmosphere that brings music and, and the vibes of food outside and the DJs sometimes. On a Sunday, we have what we call Blocos, Afropan, uh, which is one of the other bands. Um, they have kept that tradition every Sunday for the months of July, uh, where they will have a Bloco. It's like a block party. 
but everybody will congregate there and listen to pan music and the bands will play or they will invite other bands to come out. Um, the atmosphere, the atmosphere is one of these. I will um, engage young people to come out to play. So they will come and start rehearsing with us. Parents may drop off their children. Some parents bring their children and they stay. Uh, parents like Ivor, uh, myself, um, we have several parents who ended up having kids that started playing in the band. Or they would drop off their kids and then eventually we said to them, why you sit down in the pan yet and you're not learning to play a pan? You know, things like that we would say to them. And we engaged them. Because we saw that when we engage the children, we engage the community. And we engage the parents, we engage the families. That means that we have less kids. And, and you know, as Ivor said, sometimes people say, you know, we don't want our kids on the street doing things that they shouldn't be doing. But really and truly, when you engage them and you have a place for them to be, um, like in the pan yards, it's, it's a good thing. Um, there's others who say they don't want their kids at a pan yard because there's too many things that are vulgar going on. No, but if you have a community group, and which is what we run under, a uh, community program, and, and because of that, I think that is the best way to keep that atmosphere, where we go into the carnival side of it, where is Calypso music, and we are using that opportunity to keep the culture alive. Okay. I hope. Yeah. Let me say something there. The, um, ju ju just from a historical standpoint, uh, that Wendy is talking about North America, um, where we have winter, and so the pan yard actually comes indoors and then goes outdoors in the summer. In, in the Trinidad context, all steel bands are outdoors. live outdoors. Yeah. So um, while they might store their instruments indoors, when the practice is going on, the, the instruments are outdoors, all the players, like 100, and uh, the, the, the limit now is 120 players for the panorama. And each band lives outdoors. So each band has a location, an outdoor location, that used to be a backyard. Um, in most cases now, they, the, the, steel bands, the steel bands went through a, a period where that property was owned by somebody else. Uh, most of the steel bands now have managed to acquire the location. Even Eddie Manette's steel band for the longest while didn't own the property that the band rehearsed on. It was, it was part of his mother's, his, his parents' backyard that evolved into a pan yard. So it, it's really evolved from a literal yard. Uh, most of these, most of these orchestras started in somebody's backyard mm -hmm. and evolved to a, a property that's maybe the size of this room or, or, or somewhat bigger as the permanent property. Sometimes they, 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 they expand even beyond that at carnival time when when they have when they're dealing with 120. So it really came from being a literal outdoors thing, and it still is a literal outdoors thing. Most of them are, have a have a roof now, some some sort of um, ceiling above them for, for rain, you know, so they don't they can still practice while it's raining. Okay, thanks. Okay, we we'll take our own Karen, yeah, and then Paget, and any other hand, Veronica. Thank you, panelists. This was really quite rich. I'm interested to know how uh, an orchestra is organized and who owns what, if anything, and um, how do you keep how do you keep going? Okay. So, Paget, we take three questions. Paget and then Veronica. Did you want? And then I can. Yeah. Can you elaborate on her? Oh. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, I just thought it should be. It's not on. Okay. You hear me now? No. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Just stop. Just stop. Don't just talk. No, hold it. Just oh, in case it's working. Oh, okay. No, I just thought that I think it's, it's important that you hear that the culture of the steel band has spread outside of Trinidad, mm -hmm. across the region, mm -hmm. right? That uh, a lot of what you've heard described uh, in Trinidad, you can go to Antigua, St. Kitts, Grenada, and
and mm -hmm. uh, you will see all of this. Mm -hmm. But there's a special special voice coming out of Antigua. Mm -hmm. There are people in Antigua who claim that they no. are no. I kid you not. Mm -hmm. uh, they claim also Say what? that mm -hmm. brute force, <laughs> brute force was the first steel band to be caught. And so there is a, no, there's a lot of competition uh, among the islands uh, about their role in certain innovations mm -hmm. uh, in the steel band. So there's no question that Trinidad is the leader. I'm certainly not contesting that. But just in terms of how it has spread across the region, there's always these little, you know, jostlings between the islands. And uh, just within the terms of um, how the steel band has come to where it is today, there are certain contributions that some islands think that, okay, that's our contribution. The budget, half of Trinidad is Grenadian, yes. so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 yeah, true, true, true. Okay, so we'll um, hear Veronica's question. Sure. Veronica is here, and then we'll have. Yeah. Okay, Veronica here. She yeah, she did. She was asking. She's asking oh, about you, the band. Sorry, you weren't finished? No. Oh. Yes. No, 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 no. I want to take three questions and then we go to the panel. Sorry, yeah. Um, thank you so much. This been, the uh, panel has been wonderful, super interesting. Uh, a question, Wendy, uh, I'm so uh, excited about uh, what you said about um, attracting children, giving them a place to belong, creating community, and all of these things that I think we're kind of losing in a certain way in today's societies. Um, my question is, who are these children that you're attracting now to the steel bands? Uh, how heterogeneous is the group? And do you find other people being interested? And how do you, you talked about female and male, uh, but who else is joining or who's interested? Um, I, I, I keep thinking as what you described as an alternative to this craziness about sports, raising children. I always thought it would be great if they learned an instrument and it was a permanent fight to have them look at something different than sports. And I think it's so wonderful that this is a different opportunity. And I think music is less competitive in a way. And I think all of that is wonderful. So I'm going to also um, include Ivor in the um, answer to this. Okay. Ivor is also a retired teacher. And uh, what we have in Toronto is called um, Pan in the Schools. And Ivor was involved in that for many years, although I said I came out of the school program also. And uh, most of us that came out of that very first steel pan program that I was referring to, we are still playing. And most of our kids play with us in our band or they've gone on to other bands. Um, the majority of kids that come in now we see are from different walks of life. Um, Ivor has also been a part of that experience because he taught pan in the schools also. And um, we have, in the summer what happens is that you will get young people who are interested because we play a lot and we play at different um, functions. So people will see us automatically and say things like, oh, I'd love my child to learn how to play. And we'll say, bring them, uh, we'll teach them. And it happens in all the bands in Toronto. Um, there's different programs that are going on and uh, we will tend, if a band is not um, up and running until let's say April, we will send most kids, we direct them to other groups that we can say, okay, take your child here or there. Uh, one of the programs that we have in Toronto is under, that I, I regularly send people to is Tropicana Community Services. We have a steel pan program there. We have church groups who are running programs. I run one of those also. Um, but the main thing is that how do we uh, um, get the kids in is that usually with, for instance, like the month of July, like I, I mentioned, it's a busy time that all bands will see a fluctuation of people's coming in 
to the bands to learn to play. We have people coming. We had one young lady that came as far as from Japan, and she found us. And Nana still, um, she just went back home, but uh, she has been playing with us for the last three years. And she has actually um, had a goal, and her goal was to go to all the panoramas around the islands to play. She goes to New York, she goes down to Antigua, Grenada, she was in St. Kitts, um, Miami. Everywhere there's a panorama, she, her goal is to play in every single band. She didn't speak much English, but she understood when she listened to the music. She would interpret it, write it down, and this is who she was. We also have, if you, um, a lot of people go online and they listen to bands in Japan, Australia, um, just around the world, Miami, different places. And, and we don't dispute who was the first. All we know is we Trinidadians and the pan come from Trinidad. <laughs> Um, and I was just going to elaborate on the little pieces I was talking about with, with, with yeah. the pan in the schools. Right, so your question has several aspects to yes. it, right? And I mean, I'm going to link it to my comment that the pan itself is a great instrument, period. So with um, sometimes, I mean, we don't, we shouldn't have to do it. We can detach it from its history. I mean, being associated with resistance, you know, decolonization, the yearning of the human spirit for music as, you know, psychic reinforcement, psychological, you know, the identity, blah, 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 right? Okay? <laughs> it's a great instrument, all right? Because we know what the other instruments are, right? Which are usually based in the Eurocentric, you know, program. And not only say, we don't say, like, it should be, we, we should remove, you know, European cultural um, things, all right, from the school, all right, but we should broaden, you know, whatever music, musical ideas, musical cultures are taught in the schools. And one of the things that attract the young people is the fact that the steel pan is associated with popular music, mm -hmm. all right? A lot of popular music involved, whether the popular music is from North America, all right, I mean, Jamaica, all right, and even Trinidad, so or even Latin music. Today we had a great audience over by <laughs> Central Falls where even the kids just got up. When they heard Despacito and Bailam also, they were shocked. Too, right? <laughs> but they got up on their dance. So um, immediately, you know, I mean, if, if they wanted to establish a steel band there and then, but, they came out and they gave, said, like, we give you like $100,000 for the pens, all right, and they take one of us to teach them. It could have been done, mm -hmm. all right? Because they heard their music and they heard pretty good music. So that's one of the ways they're attracted, all right? Um, some other aspect with the school bands. I mean, the, it's great that the bands have included the steel pan and the st music generally associated with steel pans, all right, in the schools, all right? <coughs> the next step that really has to happen on, on a really, um, I should, more serious level is it has to be whatever experiences they have, all right, or a major part of the experiences should be rooted in the curriculum guidelines, mm -hmm. the mus musical or the curriculum guidelines for music of the Ontario Board of Education and little all other boards of education. That way, you know, you, you try to regularize or, you know, all the other aspects of musical instruction around the pen while keeping the aspect that includes popular music, all right, and music with, um, you know, like different flavors on the pan. And the one thing you talk about who is involved, in the schools you find there are numerous ethnicities, all right, playing pan. So you go to now to some of the schools, you might think, I know a s one band, I think that they are mainly, you look at them and you think like, oh, is this a Philippine instrument? All right, the kids are all from Filipino background. So you can go to some schools and see like, because they teach the music and they have an instructor who knows the pan, they play the music. And there's some instructors where there's many different, you know, backgrounds on the instrument. And they, like I said, again, it's a great instrument. Right. There was a question on, on it as a, an orchestra, how it functions as an orchestra, was yeah. it? How it functions as an organization. Organization. Uh, like who owns oh. the instrument? How okay. do they get replaced? What is the organizational structure like? And how, how do you um, create longevity? We've been together, the band has been together for, as I said, 32 years. Um, and it's, and, and there's bands in Toronto, including Afropan, that has been a long um, a standing band in the community. Uh, to have a band standing that long, and as we look at Trinidad and we see the names, that, like when you see Catelli All Stars and BP Renegades, these are bands that started out way back in the 40s, 
um, and, and, and just evolved. So bands evolve. Um, we had a str we have what we call a structure in the band that, that was able to apply for funding. We applied for funding and we received that funding and that was how we were able to buy our first set of instruments. And once we were able to do that, one of the things that has to start happening, you have to house these instruments. And in housing the instruments, of course you have to know where you're keeping them. Then we went on to purchase these racks, which cost us anywhere from $20,000. Where are we getting the monies to build them and store them? The pans, same thing. Um, so as Ivor said, you can get a grant for $100,000 and buy instruments. You can get a grant for $10,000 and buy 10 pieces. Um, for Pan Fantasy Steel Band, all our instruments at this point in our lives are, were made in Trinidad. And we have them shipped up every when, we, when we're in need of pans. So we bought our first set of instruments in Toronto under a gentleman by the name of Ed Peters who was making instruments in Canada at the time. And we purchased those and the longevity of those is, could be anywhere between 10 to 15 years depending on the instrument and how, how it depreciates really quickly. Mm -hmm. So the, you get pans that are good, we call them, and you get better pans. Mm -hmm. So the better pans in Trinidad, we don't know. But what we did is that we engaged a tuner from Trinidad. And the sound um, that we get from the instruments um, from this particular gentleman by the name of Roland Harrigan, who blends our instruments, he makes them, sends them up, he comes up, he blends them. And in order to do that now, if your band is not a money-making band, our organization is a nonprofit organization. So we do events throughout the year. And with the funds that we raise, that we get from these events, it goes back to the organization to keep the instruments up to par, um, to blend. We call it a blend. It's tuning the instruments like a piano, the same thing. So if you drop one and you dent it or you put it out of tune, as we would say, you have to pay to get those fixed. And in paying that, you're looking at anywhere, when we purchase one, is anywhere from 1000 to 1500 that we pay for one. So you have them blend. If you're blending a band that has at least a 100, 100 piece band, you know you're spending at least a good $5,000 and up. Okay. So we try to make sure that we don't, how do we say it? We don't uh, um, beat the pan. Uh, <laughs> we abuse, play, abuse, abuse them. The we play them. Um, and in playing them, that means, as I was saying to the young man in the back there, he was on my bass today, and I said, boy, don't hit my pan too hard. <laughs> <laughs> we were laughing. But it, it's, it's the reality of what we're talking about. It's just like a regular instrument. You don't abuse it. Um, so that way, it lasts us a longer time. Um, so when we put up our instruments on the racks, the sound that we get is a, is a nice sound versus having them on the ground um, flat. Um, as our, our fellow um, brother here said, the sound is something that you want to keep. So what I had to understand was the person that blend our instruments, you were asking that question, he gave us a sound. There's a certain sound that the band has now. So if I call you to come and blend, and he's the one that's blending over here, you would have changed the sound of our instruments. So we tend to have it um, one. So in answering your question, how do we keep the band going? The funds that we raise is to house the bands and to keep the instruments up to par. Um, if an instrument cracks, we have to replace those. And in replacing that, that means you have to get the person that's making them to replace each one. For, for most of us in Toronto, um, the home of the instrument is important. And we all don't have homes, so we have to store. And if we're storing, we're paying for storage until it's time to take them out. A lot of, um, a lot of the bands are non for profit, and therefore, if you are the leader of the band, sometimes the money comes out of your pocket to keep the band going. And we've done that over the years, uh, myself and, and Edwin and, and other members of the band. And it's hard, because if you want to keep the band going in the summertime, you have to look at things like refreshments, um, little things that you need, like washrooms. You have to pay for a portalette if you're outside. 
you have to get a tent if you're outside because it's going to rain and the inclement weather is going to happen. Um, so as Tony also said, in the winter months, you may be indoors, but in the summer, when your band grows, you need to be outdoors. So there's little things that you will need. Um, it's a quite expensive thing, and, uh, and, and as I said, if you're not funded or sponsored by anyone in particular, you have to raise that money yourself. For bands that don't charge a, a fee to, um, to teach, we don't, um, because we've always had that um, philosophy that it's going to be free. But if we have to purchase t-shirts or we have to travel, we ask sometimes for donations and parents come forward and uh, there's other organizations that will come forward and sponsor one or two of the kids that are going with us. Okay, thank you. I have two questions, but you have to answer them quickly. They're big questions, but you don't have the time for Brian and Sophia. Brian, what's the significance of naming? You talked about Red Army. Tip Tripoli and uh, Zofia, how did that, just a little summary of that part of the history that you didn't get to, how you move from the marginalization, the, the origins of the steel pan in the most marginalized youths, it being more in its more commercial form. Anybody, any other questions as far as we? I just have the most basic question. And I think I know what you'll say in part, but how long does it take to become proficient? Not to learn the instrument, because I suppose that's a lifelong pursuit, but just how long does it take till you can play with a band? Okay, anybody hey, else? This, so that's, this, this, that's a question, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a quick question. Once you have an ear for music, I think um, I was listening to someone and they said really quickly, and this was someone in Trinidad, and they said, you know when you go and you learn an instrument, it takes longer. But with a steel drum, you're listening, and we can actually start teaching you a song within 20 minutes, if you can listen. And that's what Ivor was doing today when we were doing the scales. We teach you the scales. Um, you know, you're playing C, D, E, F, G, and, and you repeat it backwards. But then if we start showing you music, you'll gravitate towards the sound. Like for a bass, you know what a bass line sounds like. And, and I was singing pom pom piti pom for a reason. Pom pom piti pom. So you're gonna interpret that as I show it to you. Um, it's visual and it's also, you're listening by ear. So uh, most of the music that we do, that's how we do it. Okay. Could, I, could I add something to that? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'll go back to the lady's question there. Pan is still really informal. So there's no real structure. It depends on who you are, where you are. For some people, it's a family thing. For some people, uh, like Wendy, they, they run their steel band like a, like a family. But when, as you hear from Wendy, Wendy is almost a mother. And she, and she carries that steel band like a mother. But it, it varies. Uh, and it depends on where you are in Trinidad. Many of the bands are, are, are sponsored by major, major corporations. They started that back in the 60s, so Coca-Cola, uh, might sponsor a steel band. Shell, Shell originally sponsored Ellie, Ellie Manette's Invaders and so on. So it varies. And in each of those structures, you have um, uh, some organizational unit that looks after that particular steel band. But if you go from steel band to steel band, it's, it's all over the place. There's no fixed. Pan is actually a very, I, I don't know how they manage to run a steel band. That's a very good question you ask. Because moving those instruments around is like moving a full symphony orchestra. And everybody knows how symphony orchestras struggle for funding. And so on. A, steel, a, a, a large size steel band, 15 to 20 players, is like moving a full symphony orchestra. And it's not a problem that has been solved. Uh, it takes a lot of energy and resources or dedication of someone like, 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 like Wendy, like Wendy to do that. Okay, Brian and Sophia. Naming quickly, um, my own uh, informed guess is uh, two things. Uh, the, our, the time, which is, I, I was looking at that World War II moment and what it meant, the struggle against uh, international uh, fascism and uh, Japanese militarism and the way in which that translated in the Caribbean in the names of bands like in the Invaders, like uh, Renegades, uh, like Red Army more specifically, um, but also the question of communities and gangs. 
So communities are not just pristine places where people live, but they're also associated with gangs which, which reflect the communities and defend, in some instances, the communities or sometimes just defend themselves. Uh, so desperados, for example. Uh, later on, when, these, when the gang thing uh, starts to wind down, desperados become gay desperados. Uh, gay not in the LGBTQ sense, but in the happy sense of gay. So, so uh, and then of course there's there's the um, commercialization. So it's it's Whitco de gay desperados or or Catelli all stars, you know the, the um, um, spaghetti makers. So so um, I think there there is a whole thesis there to be written, mm -hmm. but th those are some of the sort of things we need to look at. Rachel, let me let me add to that that in fact almost every early steel man in Trinidad, all those he called Desperados, those were named after U.S. war, war movies. Uh, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, yeah. Even invaders came out. We were trying to research, we were trying to research recently where invaders came from, and there were two movies, one that came out of France and one that came out of the U.S. And it, it, it turns out that invaders was the name of a, 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 of a war movie. Red Army war movie. So if you go back, and, and that, that brings me back to, to the point that I think Brian was making, or both Brian and, and Zofia were making, uh, you, you really underestimate how much the U.S. has been involved in this. Mm -hmm. Because we got a story from Ellie when we were doing, when we were doing the, the documentary that's, that's one of the most fascinating stories of, of the pan. And remember, Ellie is the, is the guy who, who, who came up with seven of the major uh, innovations to, to, to creating this, the, the steel drum. Seven of what he, what he defines as ten major in innovations, including coming up with the con, concave surface. They used, to hit, they used to be in a convex surface with a dent in the convex surface. He's the one who decided to try co making a concave surface and then bubbling the, bubbling the notes up on that con concave surface, which bring, br brings us back to the physics. But uh, the, the, the story is they used to go down to the U.S. base, uh, Shagaramas is called, and steal the drums, the empty drums that were lined up on the U.S. base. It's a fascinating story because the U.S. base was a blocked off part of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a peninsula on the island, the, the northern, northwest peninsula of the island. They had that whole section blocked off. They would sit on time the MPs who were guarding the gate, there was a gate, there was a fence across the gate that actually used to go out into the water and go down, down as, the, as, the, as the shelf dropped away. They had a, they had a, but the fence only went out, could only go so far as the, as the, as the, as the, as the shelf dropped away below, below them. So what these guys did was go down, time the MPs who were guarding the, the whole compound. They knew they, 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 they go on, uh, they, they, they go on a, 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 a crawl around the compound. They timed how long it would take the MPs to make that crawl and come back to their position. They would then swim around, out into the water, around the fence, go in, steal one drum, swim it back around the fence, put it on a bicycle, and wheel it back miles to Port of Spain. Wow. They were motivated. Wow. <laughs> a, a lot of motivation there, you know. Thank you for that. Oh, let, me, let, 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 let me also come back to a point you made because you talked earlier, uh, it was a fascinating point you made about, about the community and coming down. And, and you actually gave me the image that I hadn't thought of it before, that in fact then Pan, you can look at Pan as a, as a, as a, as a, as a maroon community almost. Absolutely. Yeah, but the, so, so that they live as a maroon community somewhere, mm -hmm. and then they come down to engage with the rest of the society, and then go back up to their maroon community. I, I hadn't seen that before. Okay. Okay, Sophia, but um, Wendy, did you want to ask Sophia a question? No, I wanted to ask. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let Sophia answer, and then you can ask Stefan. Yes, yeah, so the question of, um, oh, is this on? Yeah. The question of um, why, does, why does it look so different today uh, in terms of who plays the pan, um, who 
consumes the music and so on um, than it did in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, the, in the early post-war period, there was, uh, Pan underwent huge changes in terms of class and who was involved and so on that really broadened it um, in Trinidad outside of the low-income marginalized black communities. Um, one of the things that ended up happening is a lot of it, interestingly, this tension between the oil companies and, and workers kind of, oil companies were trying to find ways to do what they now call, what, what's, uh, what's this, corporate social responsibility, they call that now, um, uh, corporate sponsorship. So a lot of steel bands um, and it, it started getting corporate sponsorship from oil companies. Um, so BP, Renegades, um, yes, exactly. So Amoco, Texaco, Texaco sponsored, started sp sponsoring Dixieland, which was one of the first. So in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of steel pans got corporate sponsorship from oil companies. Um, and that was one of the things that brought on the base. The second thing is a lot of white middle class or lighter skin middle class uh, Trinidadians started playing steel pan. And that was again also linked to the corporate sponsorship. So it kind of broadened the base of, of uh, steel pan. Steel pan started being played in theaters. Uh, in Trinidad as opposed to on the street. And so there was a, a, a movement. And this was pushed also by the government, the colonial government and then the post-colonial government because of the violence that they, they saw associated with steel pans and the fighting between different groups. And so government sponsorship also increased. Government invested a lot of money in, um, in, in those communities, not, not necessarily, well, we might say partly because they, they were interested in developing steel pan, but also because they were interested in getting votes <laughs> um, from those communities. And so, and they knew that those steel pan leaders were influential and foundational people in their communities. And so politicians will go in. Eric Williams, right, was noted for going into um, Lavantil and these areas um, with something called a crash program he had, which was to invest in steel pan, um, in, in the steel bands in those communities. So I think all of those things together kind of broaden steel pan outside of um, the low income marginalized communities. There was Thank a, you. There was a there was, there, was a starting, there was a starting foundation, though. Um, when they were fighting in the, in the 40s and early 50s, they used to have clashes between steel bands and people used to get killed and injured and stuff. But there was a small core of about five, five or six people in, 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 Port, in the Port of Spain area who looked at the development of PAN as something new, uh, uh, as a black innovation. Uh, my father happened to be one of, 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 those, of those five people. So I, I, I kind of have lived the whole steel band movement. And what, what they did was they, one of the problems they used to have in the carnival was, 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 was that the judging was bad, so that they would fight over the results of the competition. There'd be bad blood at the end. This band won, and this band should have won. And, and it ends off in these guys fighting, because these guys were like, we're, we're ghetto guys. There's like these. These are like your guys in Compton. You everybody. If I say Compton, you know where Compton is and what it means. These guys. Every Trinidad. Every steel band yard was a Compton, and so these guys. Don't, 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 they don't get along with each other. What they did was they started a classical competition, an annual classical competition where they used to play classical music instead of the calypsos. And that changed the whole dynamic. They used to dress up in suits and ties and so on and, 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 and play in one of the best concert halls in Port of Spain. That is what was the pivotal moment in changing the dynamic from Compton to Uptown. 
and, 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 that's, and, and that's where that went. And, and therefore, it took, it took many, many years before women were brought in and so on, but that is what started, it, it sort of planted the seed of making it acceptable. And then at the same time, the, 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 the tuners were developing better instruments. They could play better music. Once they started to play classical music, it started to broaden how people looked at the, at the potential of the instrument. And that is what kind of opened or, or, or killed the, the negative element that would have shut down the whole development. But it, it was just a, it was a handful of people, five or six people. There's a guy. There's a guy out of Florida University who has written an excellent book on the steel band movement. I forget his name. He has a very difficult name. Stumpfeld. Uh, uh, Stephen Stumpfeld. Stumpfeld. His, his book, I, I've read his book, and, and as somebody who grew up with, with a father who was part of this five people, Stumpfeld's book is the best book on the, on the steel band movement in Trinidad. If you want to really understand it, his, his book is the, gives the best overall picture. Thank you. So the final question will be Wendy's to Stefan, unless somebody else has a really, really burning question. Oh. Sorry, sorry to dominate here, but I, I failed to, uh, to answer your question. One of the things I wanted to say was that um, people in music programs know about the OFF program, which introduces little kids to playing an instrument. Steel band is actually the extension of OFF up to another level, and it's never been used like that. Trinidad hasn't seen it like that. But as, as I have lived through the program now, what I see Steel Band as, and why it's so easy to learn, is actually an extension of off. You come, you come to an instrument, you hit a note, and you get a sound. And somebody is there to guide you on how to make music with that. And, and it's actually it's time for universities to take a look at how Pan can be used as an extension of off programs in, 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 in the music industry industry. Thanks. Wendy? Uh, really quickly, thank you. Um, I was going to say that, um, Safan, we had the opportunity to meet Brian Copeland. Um, he, we, he came to Toronto when we were doing one of our shows. And um, the instrument itself, um, the theory behind uh, the acoustic side, um, for you being in that field, um, we didn't want to, we, we, we embraced it, but we weren't too sure in terms of listening to this particular instrument and listening, as you heard, um, in Toronto now, we have something called the E-Pen. Mm -hmm. And these two instruments are now, well, for the last two years, I should say, uh, there was a clash between them. Um, but the sound, um, what's, what's your theory on, on just the sound of the instrument itself and, uh, from Professor Copeland? Yeah, yeah. very quickly. Um, um, so, so Copeland invented something called a G-Pan, which, which is basically an engineer's approach to sort of perfecting some sonic, um, and sonic features of the pan while making it something that's hopefully manufacturable. Because as you, you probably all know, it, how expensive it is actually, and the timing to make a pan, the process. The same way the saxophone you know, um, has now Yamaha, for example, they have now processes in Japan that could um, you know, really manufacture it and make it available for a wider. But, but the, the, the take is that you lose, all, lose out on some of the, the more, if you want to say, the nuances that makes the instrument have its personality. So, but, you know, Copeland's take on it is that let's do both. Um, so, and uh, the, uh, the flip side of it, of, of course, is the study in the pan and trying to figure out its acoustic elements is going to inform other types of signs. And so, it, so that's the other part of it, too. I actually have a question for a change on that because um, <laughs> I, I was going to the, the, the the, the ethnomusicologists divide instruments into different classes, right? So they are idiophones and, 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 and membranophones. It, it seems to me when I look at the pan that it's actually a new form of instrument because it's, it's, it's like half idiophone and half membranophone. You strike it, but you're striking a, a vibrating surface that then sends those vibrations around and causes the, the sympathetic vibrations you're causing. Every, every other note on the pan and the skirt of the pan is actually vibrating as well. So it's, it's almost as though it's a new, completely new class 
of, of, of instrument because it's not really an idiophone and not really a membranophone either. Yeah. Yeah, the EPAN is the electric pan, it's electronic pan, but the GPAN is a hybrid. Um, yeah, so that's actually, you know, just to make, um, that was a point I was actually trying to make in my talk, which explained why that is the case. Um, I hit this table, the entire table vibrates to make a sound. The pan has that element of it, of course, but it also has individual notes, and there's an interaction between that that creates this completely new sound. And it's, we still completely do not understand the physics of that. We understand some, but not all of it. On that note, oh, we don't want to sound that either. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we will have to um, bring the event to a close. But I just wanted to thank um, our student volunteers: Elisa Perez, Maya Bleak, Vanina Morrison, Ashley Moss, Grace Mano, Devin Howard, Brian Elizade, Jessica Murray, Murphy, Dominic Kersey. Annie Fang, Bonheur, Carigio. And thank you all. And I really hope to see you and your family and your friends and your community tomorrow. We have a 600 seat auditorium to fill. OK? So everybody's welcome. Thank you all so very much. And thank you so much to our panelists.